So let me start with a story that I really like. Um, it's about this guy called Samson's Ghost. He used to write under the pen name of Samson's Ghost. And Samson was standing up in the elections in the US. And uh, he figured that there were two other guys. One of the guys he f figured was completely unscrupulous. He didn't trust him. So he decided to kind of stand down and give his share of the percentage of voters to the other guy. And then everybody was like, oh my god, you know, like you pretty much had the largest number of voters between the three of them. You could have won the election. So it's like it doesn't matter. Like this guy won very comprehensively. Five years later, Samson again stands up for the elections. Now this time the guy that he gave up his seat for supports him in the biggest election of them all, the presidency for the USA. And Samson's ghost was the pen name for Abraham Lincoln. We've grown up over the last 50 to 100 years thinking that we have to be super selfish. Altruism is really bad. Philanthropy is a really bad word. Charity is really bad. But when you start giving, um, you actually get a lot back eventually because it's just not a karmic circle or anything. It is just people naturally respond to people who give, who kind of make themselves a little vulnerable. So I think I like that story. And then, you know, that is the whole theme of social impact investing or social enterprise to kind of think about aspects more than just money itself. So I'm going to start with a, a poll. This is what I do when I do most of the workshops. This, this kind of tests the concept of justice. And I want to know what kind of people that I'm dealing with here. So let us just take three kids and a flute. So the first kid is Anne. She says that the flute should be given to her because she's the only one who knows how to play it. Uh, Bob says the flute should be handed to him because he's so poor that he has no toys to play with. And Carl says the flute is hers because uh, it's the fruit of her own labor. So the first person says that she knows to play. The second person is like, I have no other toys, so I should have the flute. The third person is like, I made it, so I should have the flute. So how many of them, how many of you think Anne should have the flute? Just raise your hands. Someone who can play the flute should get this flute. No one? No one thinks that she should get it? OK. Bob? No one? Bob? OK. Two? And I'm assuming everybody else seeing Carl? How many for Carl? At least I can see. OK, everybody else is for Carl. So two people said Bob, and everybody else said Carl. So I mean, this is probably the Modi way of talking as well. <laughs> Because uh, this is a very, very interesting concept of the Aristotelian concept of justice, which Amartya Sen uses in his book of the idea of justice. The first is, of course, a utilitarian, which is like socialist economies, which say that people who deserve something should get it. In a sense, someone who can play the flute the best, ideally, they should have the flute, because they can bring enjoyment to not only themselves, but everybody else. Bob is essentially communism, right? Uh, where you treat everyone equally, despite uh, the fact that uh, they may or may not have the merits. You basically say they don't have access to resources. The third is pure play capitalism. You say whatever I do and whatever are my merits and whatever material I create, I should get it. I will not give a piece of it to anybody else. So depending which spectrum you are in, you will have a concept of justice and you'll have a concept on your life and you'll make decisions based on that as well. I mean, you can probably, going forward, observe your actions more closely. Uh, here, I'm just going to quickly show you a video which puts things in context. Why do we need this whole concept of empathy? Or why do we need this whole concept of sharing? This is just a one minute video.
I know it's a pretty sad video, right? The girl gets to stand in the line to get water, and this is maybe the story with most of the districts that at least we work in Rajasthan. Um, I would like to think that this is injustice, that she has no voice. She has not made this choice. Exactly. She, has, she doesn't have, she, she, it is injustice because she doesn't have a voice. I'll, I'll explain you the difference here. Now, this is equality. There are three boxes, right? The shortest kid, all three of them have equal access to resources. The shortest kid has the same box. So does the intermediate one and so does the tall one. All three of them have the same box. Resources have been spread equally, right? Now, this is justice, where the shortest kid gets the box from the tallest kid and he, all three of them are able to watch the game. When we think about investing or enterprise, we have to think about how our actions have an impact on society and how society's actions have an impact on us. And then accordingly, these days I think it's easy to choose a vocation as well, which combines these two aspects, which is what I have done over the last six years. I used to be an investment banker with Citigroup in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, yeah, and, I mean, did all the evil and then uh, this, the whole concept of what I've been doing, I see that as penance for the next 30 years or 40 years. But uh, let us see now, why now, you know, this has been existing for the last 100 years or thousands of years since India has been colonized, there have been poor countries, Africa, Latin America, the West somehow has broken in, in the last 200 years, but why, why is this the essence now? Why should we act now? Because now we have so many resources at our disposal with technology as well as capital that this shouldn't happen. Eight million people every year die because of poverty, which is 22,000 people every day. And by the time the session gets over, 1,800 people would have died due to poverty. So. We, we are living in an in, in interesting age in India where half of the population doesn't have access to toilets and the other half watches a video of how they don't have access to toilets on their iPads. Which is very strange. So there needs to be not a solution, there needs to be some sort of a paradigm shift where we start thinking a little bit more about how do we calibrate not India and Bharat, but at least people across the world, the haves and the have-nots, a little bit more. So this is another poll. If a child is suffering from diarrhea, should we give her less water or more? How many say less? The answer is you should give her more water. But 760,000 infant mortality cases due to diarrhea because women think that they should give their child less water. It'd be like, what? You know, we have all been told that if you have diarrhea, you drink more water, you hydrate yourself. But the women are very, very rational. They are like, if my child is suffering from diarrhea, why put more water in a leaky bucket? But if you take the correlation between their education levels and the infant mortality deaths, it's, it's crazy. If you educate a woman up to primary education, you would have saved one million lives. You would have educated her up to secondary, you would have saved three million lives. So in the last 20 years, we were able to save 2.1 million just by improving girls' education. You know, the, the girl who was standing in the beginning trying to fetch water, if she would have been educated over a period of time, we have already saved these many lives, but we could have saved so many more. So now we know that we have the resources and education works. Now, I feel that we cannot understand this view without having a point of view. I'll, I'll just give you an example, right? This, we all know this, like the most famous, you know, still image of Manhattan right next to Brooklyn Bridge, right from the dark night, everything. And the image on the right is in Somalia. So Jeffrey Sachs, who sits on the left, runs a program called Millennium Development Villages in Somalia. I mean, it's, it's nothing bad. He does a good job. But then the guys who are sitting in New York are wondering, I recently raised $2 million to give the Somalians bed nets so that they could be saved from malaria. But still, the malaria onset is increasing. I have no idea why. 
And then some of them brave this effort and go into this region called the northeastern region where most of them are pastoralists. In a sense, they herd camels and goats. So you can see some camels at the back and some you know, goats and stuff like that. So they figured that even though they were giving them these malaria nets, the problem was the malaria nets were being used to protect their cattle, not their children. So children were dying because as a pastoralist, Cattle is more important than human beings. You uh, have been a herder for the last God knows how many years. You want to protect your cattle as close to your heart as possible and you don't care about your children. You, you can have more children, but if suddenly all your cattle gets wiped out, then you have nothing. And it's more about dignity than about existence. So point of view is really, really important. If we want to create change, we need to understand who are the people we are creating change for. Or at least we need to understand the situation and understand the problem a little bit more before we start kind of enforcing solutions. Um, so yeah, I mean, now I just, you know, what, what, what kinds of enterprises can we create? I mean, these are just barely the four, but I, I would just like to ask some of you if you've come across any organization or any kind of specific subdivisions, education, water, healthcare, whatever it is. So create a social transformation. Can anyone give me an example of any intervention that perhaps you have thought about doing which can create a transformation, a social transformation? Can we say education creates social transformation? Yeah. The second is uh, access to justice. Um, I think you can create enterprises. I, I know a couple. Maybe, I mean, this is just to kind of provide food for thought for you. One of them is Landesa, which provides uh, people who don't have land rights access to land rights. So they basically work with the government and they also work with feality or the feudal lords, which still exist in some parts of India, as well as in um, Latin America. These two are mainly the major regions where land holding is very interestingly fought for. So we can do that. Juvenile justice, children who don't have access to justice. Then essential goods and services. When you start providing healthcare at extremely low costs, you start providing water at 10 paise a liter. When you start uh, providing access to transportation to di differently enabled people. I mean, social enterprises can be different in India or in the UK. In the UK, essentially, people who are differently enabled have a special bus service. Here we don't have a bus service for normal people. So and the final is radically innovate on extreme affordability of capital goods. So come across organizations which reduce the cost of the ECG machine by one tenth. I mean, it, they bring it down to one tenth of the price. Embrace took the baby warmer and they said that it costs $50,000 to have this in a hospital. Can we, can we make it for $50? They didn't think about 20,000, 10,000. They said, let's make it for $50 or $100. So essentially, there can be many more. I'm sure you will also come across many more organizations. But essentially, these are the four areas I like to club it in. Most of the organizations will fit within these radar. So now, what is, you know, finally we come to the point. What is impact investing? Now, you've seen the, to a certain extent, the demand side. What do we need? We need services, we need people, we need entrepreneurs. But then ultimately economics is about capital and labor. Some people provide labor and some people provide capital. Unfortunately, now people who are providing capital are getting most of the returns. But that is what we're trying to change. So if you see why the arrow is marked there, because you're intersecting at commercially viable, potentially scalable, and socially benefiting the bottom of the pyramid. So you have to achieve all these three aspects. If you just get these two, doesn't matter, right? These are the Kirana shops, small little Kirana shops, commercially viable, sell two rupees sabun for 10 rupees in rural Muzaffarnagar. I mean, that's not going to help anyone. If you just have commercially viable and scalable, we already are tired of those models the Wall Street models or any of the other models. And even if it benefits and is scalable, but if it's a non-profit, 
then it won't attract a lot of capital. It will attract some capital, but if you look at the U.S. or India, there's a stark difference in the U.S. But in, since 1970s, only 144 organizations have crossed the 50 million revenue mark, or they have raised 50 million dollar worth of grants, or they're worth 50 million. Whereas 46,700 organizations, which are commercial, purely commercial, have managed to scale more than 50 million. So it's not even a competition. Capital is flowing really fast in one direction. So you have to achieve all three to get <laughs> this at the end of the day. At the end of the day, all enterprises need to have some sort of an impact. They need to stop exploiting labor. They need to stop raping the environment. They need to start taking consumers very seriously. They need to start paying their taxes. And they need to overall not have this concept of social enterprise or a CSR, but just be an enterprise and an investor who encompass all these different jargons that we use today. That is what I guess our best hope is. Now, you know, we can talk about the impact investing evolution. So here is right now, I think over the last 10 years has been complete chaos. It's like people, there are more than 100 impact investors today, whereas less than 10% of them existed 10 years ago. And now, this is, this is the version that most of the reports will use. Oh, uncoordinated innovation, marketplace building, capturing the value of marketplace, maturity. And I just like to kind of simplify it. I just say this is complete utter chaos. Nobody knows what they're doing. Here, there is a lot of self-promotion. Most of the guys are saying, I'm the, I'm the dude. I'm, I'm here. I'm the impact investment fund. I'm the social enterprise you should invest in. Third is some have hacked it. If 1,000 enterprise start, some Steve Jobs impersonator has hacked it and he's cracked the model. And then the final one, when it's maturity, the Wall Street or the hedge funds are taken over and there is like the world will start again. We'll come back here. So I just think we are in this phase now, which is risky, but still people are at least thinking about doing more apart from just kind of exploiting and just making money. The other question I always get is, what about returns? You know, how, how Shylocky are you guys? Like, how much pound of flesh do you take? So, here, I just drew a risk map and an impact map. It's a community development and financial institutions, you know, self-help groups. Then we have had a lot of non-profits which essentially never managed to scale quite a bit. The impact is not that much because they are not able to scale. But you will definitely know that they will have some impact. If you give tomorrow $100 to an organization which is preventing malnutrition, even if they are doing for profit or not for profit, you know somewhere they will save at least five kids. But they will never, if they have not found a scalable model, they will never grow beyond that. Which is what is the state of most non-profits and smaller social enterprises in India. Second is microfinance. We all know the story how it completely went up and came down. I used to work in microfinance and then I really saw it firsthand. It is just interesting. It creates some impact. The risk is now relatively low. The model is proven. These are now the things that are working. Angel investing and equity impact investments. Equity, of course, the risk is high. Personally, I will come to that. I don't think that equity should be the right instrument. but Equity, the risk is high, but also the impact is high because you force a business to think radically, innovatively. You force them to break even. You force them to use internal cash flows to fund themselves, which means their outreach is increasing, their outcomes are increasing, and eventually the impact is increasing over a period of time. I mean, I'm not going into too much detail here because I'm just keeping it at the intermediate level. I'm not going into details of how do you value social enterprises, how do you measure social impact. How do you do risk assessment of enterprises? How do you do capabilities assessment? Maybe we can have a separate session, maybe six months down the line or something. But this is mostly intermediate where I'm trying to just lay down and trying to make sense of whatever is there online right now and whatever my experience has been. And angel investing, it's new, United Seed Fund. And there are like three or four guys who are basically taking this early stage risk. The impact is high. 
as you will see in the later slide, uh, simply because we do not have much money at the bottom. Everybody wants to do post uh, proof of concept, you show me a proof of concept, you show me that you have a team, you show me this and then I will fund you. But most of the guys who are starting social enterprises are not incredibly rich. You can hack your way through a tech startup because you do not need much capital. Uh, you know all you need is to for making an app is access to internet and a laptop and maybe two really good guys, a good hacker and a good uh, designer. If these two guys meet you can basically start it off with no money practically. But to provide water to a village even outside Bangalore you need a water tanker, you need a permission, you need basically to purify that water, you need to give them access to that water and it has to be at a very slim price which means you need a lot of volume. So, it is not that easy same with healthcare, same with education it is not as easy as technology. Often we confuse these two things and then we basically think why are these social enterprises not scaling up as fast as the tech enterprises because they never will. That is why you need a different style of capital which we are talking about which is impact capital. And so, what are the returns? The returns are pretty much similar to commercial returns in a sense you can lose your entire capital. I mean maybe if you invest or if there are 10 organizations which start off maybe one or two will succeed, the remaining will fail or you might get your capital back if you structure it in a certain way. If you invest equity then you might lose everything, if you say that I am investing in 0 percent interest debt that I will give you the money, you do not pay me any interest, 10 years later you just pay me back my capital or if you essentially look at equity investments. We have seen some organizations even microfinance and beyond microfinance give us up to 25 percent. Now, you might think 25 percent is high, I think it is high for this sector, uh, but if you can generate 25 percent and create impact at the same time not sacrificing either that is the important question because ultimately if you ha the higher the return the higher the return scale the more you will have to sacrifice your impact. I will give you an example a preschool that I know essentially was catering to rural children in say rural Rajasthan and now the investors have come on and they are like well you are not making money, you are not breaking even it has been 2 years forget about rural Rajasthan now. We have to give 25 percent back to our investors people who are invested in us now you come to Jaipur and start teaching the rich kids. So, that, there goes your mission I mean the whole concept why you started this organization in the first place was so that you could empower the rural uh, rural kids in Rajasthan and, and then impact is not so easy you know to attend or to attain. These kids who you educate now in education you have to wait over a 10 to 15 year cycle, they will get educated you hope correspondingly the economy grows so that they basically find jobs because that is the number one reason people do not send their children to school they do not see the correlation between earning and income and going to school. So, this is a 10 15 year project and now if I have to basically sacrifice the 10 year project and be at the mercy of the investor who is at the mercy of his investors or her investors then you completely lose mission alignment and that is what we call patient capital. It is just another term for patient capital which is lacking to a certain extent here and as well as across the world even your mainstream investments where, where you see WhatsApp being sold for 20 billion or all these organizations which are getting crazy valuations is essentially because people like me are now investors to a certain extent even in the commercial way it is all ex investment bankers who lost their jobs and have suddenly become investors. So, and also there is this lack of overall patience this instant gratification we need to see something very soon. Even if you go to one of these hackathons everybody wants to do something in a year and then sell off their company to Facebook or something. But in the long run what has happened in India or the US or Europe is the number of companies which go public or which list have shrunk by 30 percent which means one there are very few people who are playing at the top level. So, now 80 people in the world 
earn as much income as bottom 80 percent of the world. So, top 80 people have as much wealth as bottom 80 percent. You have very few risk takers who are willing to go till the long haul and very less money from those rich people is getting reinvested back. If I have a billion dollars, I might give 10 million dollars or invest 10 million or even 100 million, but I am still sitting on 900 million which is earning me interest. So, my wealth keeps going up and then the poor sorts who work for me for either minimum wage or who essentially are working in the subdivisions of the company continue to labor, labor on, labor on. Whereas, you have yachts, you have private airplanes. So, can you guess how much wealth the top four owners of Walmart have? Just put a number there, out there. 25, okay. Fair enough, they, the top four put together have 145 billion dollars and um, more than 50 percent of Walmart's workers work at 825 an hour and have to subscribe to food stamps, which means their money is not enough. They get subsidy from the government to get food. What do you think is the situation at Reliance in India or, or Adani port? It is the same thing. I am not saying that capitalism is bad. I am just saying the inequality is increasing day by day where your workers are so, they have just completely missed the lottery. That is what it is, right? The people who are in this room have won the lottery. The people who may, may basically are in Dharavi, who are in Sirohi, in God forsaken district of Sirohi, somewhere near the Ran of Kutch on the border with Pakistan, they have lost the lottery. We have won the lottery. So, at some level, I think we should try and make the system a little bit more even queue. It should not be a lottery. Now, global potential. So, they say the global potential for impact investment till date has been 50 billion and has the potential to go to 1 trillion in the next 10 years. And the majority of this 1 trillion will start coming from mainstream enterprises, not just specifically impact investors. You see all these fancy ads from Vedanta for all the pollution they are causing and all the inequality, they have this small little CSR video or standard chartered. Now, I mean I do not know if you, if you notice there is a lot of focus now towards I am good, being good for change, you know. And uh, because people are realizing now that it is no longer enough just to either make money or be a non-profit. You know, that is a great example of uh, uh, this this CEO, I mean they say that 8 years off Stanford Business School, an average person makes 400,000 dollars, 400,000 dollars. An average CEO of a, a non-profit in the US makes around 150,000 dollars. An average CEO of a non-profit which focuses on hunger, famine and health makes 80,000. So, where is 400,000, where is 80,000, right? I am taking the US example because it is so stark, it is 5. In India, it might be 10, 15 times as well because data is more easily available for the US. But it is so easy for the guy who is making 400K to give 100,000 dollars to the hunger charity, sit on the board of the hunger charity and make his life miserable, then go and run a hunger charity himself. He will give 100,000, he will get 50 percent tax for EBIT or whatever, at the end he saves 50,000 dollars. For 50,000 dollars, he can basically kind of make the life of the guy who is actually wanting to make a change pretty miserable. We are not attracting talent because we are not paying people more. So, this will over a period of time I think change because you will have more capital coming in for sure, I already see that and you will have more opportunity and India. So, we have not got much of the pie, 1.6 billion has been the total amount invested so far, uh, greater than 220 enterprises. But my biggest, my biggest concern is 60 percent of the investments were made in top 15 enterprises. 60 percent of 1.6 billion dollars went to 15 companies. That is why angel investing becomes so important you are not pushing many companies through, you are not attracting a lot of 
talent by supporting them with your capital. A lot of talent just completely withers away because they don't have access to capital or they don't have access to resources. It is improving, but this is really, really risky to give so much capital to just 15 organizations. And this other top three sectors, 54 percent is microfinance, 17 percent is financial inclusion and 11 percent is healthcare. So, you have 70, sorry, 82 percent of money just going to three sectors. These just three sectors, what about education, what about water, do people don't need these services. So, why is that the case? I think this graph provides you an excellent kind of overview that it is only the last five years where the number of organizations which do clean energy, agribusiness, livelihood, water, education have sprung up and it is largely because of the capital that has flown in, but also because of the information that is being easily accessible and available and people are seeing alternative career choices. I now meet a lot of people from IITs who do not want to do their you know business degree or masters in the US, but want to create a low cost housing company, because they have worked as a, pro as a project in their uh, undergrad or they want to create a low cost med device. They do not want to basically go to the US, join the IT or join Wall Street. But this is the overall landscape, United Seed Fund at the early stage, Mumbai Angels at the early stage, we basically invest anywhere between 200,000 now all the way to 10 million, Omidyar usually comes at a later stage, so does Venture East, Acumen invests through the channel. So, this is what we do, um, very, very briefly, so we have been around for 6, 7 years now. Um, I manage the India portfolio, South Asia portfolio, I focus on education and financial inclusion, but also look at other sectors. Um, so, we do grants and equity and debt. So, two of our portfolios in net organizations in India are grants. So, the first video you saw is one of our uh, portfolio organizations called Educate Girls. We gave them, um, we, we have been involved with them for the last four years now. They started off with 500 schools in one district in Rajasthan, now they are in 4000 schools. By the end of the year, there will be 8000 schools reaching over 1 million children every year. Um, and I mean, at least in my lifetime, what I can say is I have seen some impact in a sense when we entered this district of Pali. It was one of the most gender skewed districts in Rajasthan. And after 4 years, these guys, I mean, it is like all credit to them. They have now completely wiped out the gender disparity. So, Pali is a 100 percent gender neutral district, which means every single girl child who should be in school is in school and this is just one district and it has taken us so much time to figure this out and there are 26 such districts in India. So, grants are we feel are important that probably is, uh, but we only extend grants to organizations which specifically focus on one particular aspect want to scale fast, otherwise we do equity or debt, we invest anywhere between 0 0.5 to 10 million. So, far we have made 45 investments across 4 continents, and then we also have this program called impact catalyst fellows. If anybody is interested to know more about it, um, it is just a fellowship for 11 months. People across the world are encouraged to apply and they work with the social enterprise for 11 months. But these are people who have 5, 6 years of experience. You could be technology hackers, you could be coders, you could be managers and our portfolio organizations put up the job descriptions. You could apply online or your organization could apply online. So far, the service is to some of our partners and portfolio organizations. But what we usually do is whatever the candidates that we get, we, we usually send out 30 fellows and we get 300 candidates. So, the remaining 270 we just send it out to other organizations saying these are the people who are really interested. We have done the legwork of pulling them in and short, you know kind of shortlisting them. You can use them, I mean they can use you and you can use them if you want. Um, so, here uh, we, we work in Latin America, um, Europe now, UK specifically. India, Africa and Southeast Asia. So, we have 45 organizations in 6 world regions. So far, we have invested 29 million dollars and improved slightly more than 5 million lives over the last 5 years, 6 years. LGD Impact Ventures is registered as a foundation. So, whatever money we make will go back into the foundation. So, none of us have any carry and stuff like that. We have a fund in the UK which has a 
kind of a hurdle rate of 7 percent that they have to give back to the investors. We got 10 million dollars from the UK government and 10 million from external investors. So, we have to give them 7 percent and the idea is clear none of us has any crazy variable salary. I mean the thing is we are also trying to experiment what works and what does not. What kind of people do you need? What kind of entrepreneurs do you invest in? What kind of returns should you target? Um, so far I do not think I do not think we have gone wrong, but of the 45 organizations as you can see only 36 are still going on. So, 9 have of here 9 have completely either gone bankrupt or we have exited and uh, so, the, I think this is one interesting aspect I like is there is a lot more innovation happening in this sector I feel both from the intervention perspective where you have to radically innovate uh, as well as from the financing. I mean you are seeing something like revenue based financing forget about traditional equity why do not you give me a share of your future revenues or hybrid instruments where you combine debt and equity from the get go where you have very little overall equity long term return like you said, but have like 1 percent interest or 2 percent interest or something. Factoring which is really interesting for some of the organizations which have receivables. This organization called investor development is doing it in Africa, but they are pooling a lot of these receivables and they are financing them upfront. So, that all this cash becomes available to social enterprises which they can put back to use. I know this is getting a little technical, but I just wanted to kind of just briefly touch on this. And finally, what I am really excited about is the social impact bonds, which are really completely radically changing how non-profits as well as how governments get involved directly. So, there will be a short announcement next week, we worked on it partially a social impact bond being launched in India, it will happen in June second week. So, we are very excited to be associated with this organization.